Welcome to Mile High Reefers. I'm Scott Anderson, and I'm joined again by Darren DeGraw, a.k.a. Rogue Aquariums. Follow him on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Darren, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Scott. So for today's video, I thought we would talk about stocking. So stocking your tank, coral, fish, whatever. We're going to take 20, 30 minutes and just talk about stocking levels. No real agenda. We're just going to talk about stocking. So um, when I first saw Darren's old system, I was blown away because you would buy just the coolest fish, put them together, and make it work. And some of your stocking stuff at the time was so much more on the Fowler system. Just stuff that maybe doesn't work in a reef tank. So those are fun, cool fish. So Darren, let's just start with some of your favorite fish and what you like to pair them with. When I first got in the hobby back in 2015, after being in the freshwater for about 20 years, I uh, um, decided to do a fowler, uh, something that was easier. I didn't know anything about corals, so to speak. So I, I had a 300 left over uh, from my freshwater days. So uh, like Scott said, I, I got away with some fish that you couldn't have in the corals. Otherwise, they'd be probably nipping them. They were those fish that were on the fringe. Uh, yeah. When it come to uh, reef reef safe. Um, so I had some different types of angels in there. I had uh, um, different wrasses. I had some uh, a lot of butterflies and um, tangs. Uh, tangs and wrasses are my favorite. But um, yeah, I had a a pretty good stocking level in there. So I would introduce them at, at different times uh, of the day, mostly at nighttime. Um, I would. Uh, acclimate them with a box so the fish could get used to them. I try to pull a lot of the tricks I used to use when I had cichlids. So the difference between freshwater and saltwater is you can move their, their scaping around. Uh, you can't do that with saltwater. Especially not <laughs> so, on a reef. Once yeah, especially on a reef. You, you're not going to get away with that. Um, but uh, so I would do that or I would feed them. I would feed the fish and then I would introduce the other fish in there. But with saltwater, what I would do is I introduced them at nighttime. So the, uh, the other fish couldn't see them coming in. Um, and I also tried the acclimation part of it where the fish would stay in a, in a box, the acclimation box for a few days. The other fish could get used to them and then I would release them at nighttime that way too. So, but there was a big difference in my opinion of introducing uh, fish in a uh, reef system versus a freshwater system. So I want to say that there is more art to this than science. I mean, you'll see fish together that shouldn't go together, and then you'll see fish that you should be able to get put together that just fight. So I want to say, like, right off the bat, before we get into this, there aren't really hard and fast rules because it's really you're dealing with wild animals. They all have their own personalities, and some will just be a pain, and others will be fine, and it'll be within species. It just gets crazy. So the biggest one I can think of I did personally was I got up to nine tangs in my 210-gallon reef, which I... Looking back at, I would say was too many. I, I never should have gone with that many tanks. But to begin with, one thing with tangs was I just started off by doing separate genuses. And that worked pretty well. So I put one zebra soma in there. I kept one powder blue. I kept a one of just every genus. And once I rounded out my genus, I was kind of good. It wasn't so I started adding lots of the same genus in there when I tried to have a yellow and two purples or something like that, that it got a little stupid. I think if you're going to run fish of the same genus, you should put them in all together. Yes, that is or huge. Or you should put them in at separate times, uh, actually at nighttime, or try the acclimation box uh, um, experiment that way. So there's different, there's three different ways that you know you can do it. But like you said, uh, some fish, if they're within the same genus, sometimes they'll accept the other fish, and sometimes you've just got that one fish that is just going to pound on the others. Um, I had that happen um, 
in my freshwater days when you have some of the same fish of the same genus, they're conspecific, but you could get away with it. And there's some fish that you would have that one that would just pound the others. Um, it was just, it just happens, especially when you're dealing with cichlids. But I find out with, with tangs, you got away with having nine tangs for a long time. And, uh, and then sometimes the fish all of a sudden just become aggressive and, you know, then you've got a problem. However, with your system is larger so you could get away with it. And you had a lot of, uh, with your rock structure, a lot of your fish could, you know, could dart in there and hide in there, but you know, it's not really cool for the fish to be, uh, <laughs> to be no. in, prison in their own cave, but, uh, um, but you make, you make a great point that size and hiding spaces are big. I so think a big tank, a big tank makes go, a huge If you're going to go with fish of the same genus, I think having a bigger tank and a, a good rock structure is is important. I think that uh, it's going to give the fish an advantage uh, or it's going to give the fish enable the ability to hide in there until uh, the other fish gets tired of him or he uh, basically um, he's dominant over him and uh, basically accepts him over a period of time. But I, I think having that is important. But it's, it's counterintuitive because having more hiding spots usually means the fish will be out more because that fish will ha know that it's swimming around and it's got a place that it can just dart off to. Where if you've got just a couple of hiding spots that all the fish have to get to, then they all just kind of hide and they're back in that hole and it's terrible. So having a rock structure with lots of hiding spaces actually means the fish are out more. It's counterintuitive, but that's been kind of my luck with it the more hiding spots i give the more they're out it actually works pretty good no i agree exactly uh, especially if a fish is being harassed by by another one of the same genus it gives him the ability to to dart in and out of, of the holes and uh, i think that's important but uh but i do agree with you when you get fish of the same genus is i would tend to introduce them at the same time um also your Aggre more aggressive fish of the same genus um i would add later on and make that add that one fish last to your absolutely stocking, to your stocking so the other fish are used to your system this fish is the new uh, the new kid on the block coming in and uh it's going to take him some time to get used to it where all the other fish are established absolutely so that's going to be a big part. And then just total amount of fish. That's where it gets really hard to figure out because you've got a lot of things that go into your stocking levels. Um, in the old days in freshwater, they give you this rule of so many inches of fish per gallon. And to me, that's all just crap. It doesn't mean anything in the reef yeah. aquarium hobby. Um, really, for a reef aquarium, kind of less is more for the health of the tank itself. But that's not what we want as Aquarius. We want to be able to put more fish in and have that nice balance of reef and fish tank. And that's where life gets hard and it gets tricky. Trying to make different species work together that don't eat your coral and having filtration so that you can have all of these fish without polluting your tank too much and running into um, nitrate and phosphate issues. That's all got to be taken into context. So part of your stocking is really got to be figured out when you design your system. So however you design your system has to be designed around the bio load that you want to put in that tank. So if you want to run a high bio load, you have to be able to remove all of those nutrients or you'll do like I did and screw it all up and have an algae explosion <laughs> and it'll go to crap on you. Yeah, you're right. Um, there's a lot of factors that come into play and, you know, you've you've been in this uh, in, into the uh, marine side of it a lot longer than I have. So you've dealt with different things. But I uh, I equate um, this to when I had uh, large cichlids and uh, you ran into the same problems. Um, the inch per fish per gallon roll, I think is, you, you kind of throw that out the window. It's kind of a, as a guide back in the old school days, but uh, filtration and uh, water flow and biodiversity are main keys that you have to uh, look at too, you know, when you're, when you're deciding how to stock a tank. And a lot of times it's just luck. Um, you can get some of the same fish, same genus that'll get along great with each other. But I think having uh, a good rock structure 
and uh, a lot of good swim throughs for the fish is really important also. Also what I used to do back in the day, um, I used to have dither fish. Also, uh, if I was running some uh, big cichlids, I would have some uh, silver dollars I would put in there or some red hooks. So now in the, the reefing uh, reef side of it, you know, I guess you could add larger schools of chromis if you could, if you had the big enough tank or some antheas, um, since they were mid to upper upper levels uh, fish. Um, it really helps play that uh, that key point here where you can have some distraction if you've got fish of the same genus and you've got the other fish moving in and out. It'll it'll help. I find that you know it's helped me in the past. So uh, when I get my system up and running. If I run into that problem, I can get some uh, get some dither fish in there. This is a really cool idea. I'd like to see a school of like a hundred chromas in your tank. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah, I know. I know. I I, I do plan to uh, to have uh, some antheas in there and uh, possibly some chromas, but definitely some antheas, some different uh, different schools of antheas in there. Um, but I'm sure I'm going to run into some aggression issues. I'm just going to try to do my best uh, to uh, control that. Um, so when I do plan on, like, say, for adding tangs, I've already got a black tang already, um, and I'll probably get a, a purple and a, some yellow. So I'll add them at the same time because my black tang is, will be the biggest fish in there. So, Well, and uh, then they're all zebra soma. So that's why right. you want all at the same time. So nobody has the ability to stake a claim and build some dominance. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, I think that, that that really helps when you're dealing with tangs uh, when you're dealing with fish that are the same genus. Um, it really helps because you've got, like, say, for a zebra soma versus an acantharis. Um, they don't look the same. They're not from the same no, genus. No, no. I really think that helps. That's very true. And um, I've noticed that as well. Um, the look is almost more important than the genus because I noticed with the big desert dini tang, which looks just like a sail fin, that the yellow tangs and the purple tangs didn't pick on it like they would pick on something that looked like them. Because the yellow tang looks like a purple tang, just different colors different color where, yeah. the, where the desert Dini is enough different that i don't think they see it as the same thing right they don't see it as a threat or you know uh looks like exactly like the like another fish like uh like you said with a yellow zebra zoma versus a with a black or a uh, purple you know um you'll have issues with that or so another i guess one thing i want to bring up though is another important part of stocking a tank is knowing what you want to keep before you put the tank together. So your tank is still filling with water as we speak, but you've already got this list of the types of fish you'd like to see, which is actually really important because you're already planning before the tank goes together as to which fish are going in and when. Exactly. Yeah, I do have a list together of fish that I want. Not because, oh, this fish looks really, really cool, or this is really colorful. I'm trying to plan it what's going to go with what. Um, there's a couple of tangs that I want to add that are more aggressive, so they're going to go in last. Um, but everything else will go in at the same time. Um, I'll be adding some uh, wrasses also, the reef safe wrasses. Uh, there's a list of that I'd like to do um, that I like to add. Um, as well as uh, schools of antheus, and those, those will go in at once. So, yeah, I do have a, a list I have put together that, that I'm definitely going to be adding on there. So, and I've done research on those fish. I mean, that's not fail safe. It, it, you know, things can happen. Um, but I think if you do your homework on the fish that you want, um, and if they'll go together with the other, other fish, I think that's half the battle right there. So, Rasses are another one that are this super diverse line of fish that you really do have to pay attention to the aggression on. Um, I've got a Christmas wrasse in my tank. It's a fairly old fish at this point. Absolutely beautiful. But I cannot put another wrasse in that tank that looks anything like him. I tried putting a leopard wrasse in a few years ago, and it just went so horribly wrong. Now, I've put yellow wrasses, I've put different wrasses in the tank, and it's fine. <clears throat> but if the wrasse looks anything like a Christmas wrasse, it does not like that fish. It will try to kill it. 
Exactly. When you're dealing with rashes, too, from what I know, yeah. um, know all the scientific names, but I know that there's if you've got a peaceful rash, of, like a fairy rash with a with a rash that can be more <clears throat> more aggressive, then you're going to have problems. Um, you know, I don't care how big your tank is. So, right. you know, if you're dealing with a with a rash from the same genus, that's really going to help a lot. Yeah. But I was just noticing, even with this wrasse, they'd be completely different genuses. If it looked similar, it hated that fish. Yeah. So I, I could put yellow wrasses in. It was fine. They look completely different. Christmas wrasse? Not okay. Or, <laughs> sorry, not a Christmas wrasse. Um, leopard. Uh, yes, the leopard wrasse? Not okay. Yeah. You know, and I'm talking about the vermiculate, not the kind of black and white one. I'm talking about the vermiculate that looks fairly similar to a Christmas wrasse. Right, right, and I've seen your system too, and you've got a lot of a, a lot of uh, uh, rock work in there. Yeah, a lot of rock work, a lot of sand for these guys to hide in, mm -hmm. and I guess that's another big thing, right? Like um, a lot of people like bare bottom, but if you want to keep rasses, sand beds are something to think about because rasses like not all species, but a lot of rasses like to hide in the sand bed to sleep. I agree with that too, and uh, you know, some people will have a bare bottom with a with a, uh, a little container with sand in for the fish. But I I just think it takes away from the aesthetics of the tank if you're going to do that. You know, I would advocate uh, either going with a bare bottom or going with a sand bed. You don't have to make it really deep, but um, um, you want to make it fairly good, fairly deep if you're going to have some rasses. You know, more than an inch where they can burrow in, but there's a lot of rasses that will hide in the rock work too. So um, I don't know how many different types of rasses like to burrow in the sand, but I know there are a few. Yeah, I mean, most of the ones that I've ever kept like to burrow. So I'm a, that's one of the big reasons I like sand beds, but it's one of those things that you have to think about when you're designing your tank. Um, do you want rasses and do you want to bare bottom sand bed well if you want those then you have to figure out how you're going to handle that problem because a christmas rest and a bare bottom sand bed may not be as good for the rass as having some sand down there right right it'd probably do okay it'd probably find a rock to hide against or something but it's going to stress it out more than having a nice deep sand bed for it to hide in does your christmas rest does it burrow every night every night is it it seems like it's on clockwork when i had a uh, oh yeah when I had my Red Sea Reefer set up with my Melanaris Ras, he would burrow at the same time every every day. It was kind of kind of funny to watch him. Even if you put in some food after that, he wouldn't come up. He was in in for the day. <laughs> so um, absolutely. So your Christmas Ras does does burrow every every night then. Every night, and then um, I guess another one is going to be your kind of fish on the fringe, as you were calling them. Um, but you're basically your reef safe with caution fish. Yeah. So these are other species. If you want to keep them, you should really think about ahead of time and how you're going to handle it. Yeah, a lot of people want to, you know, what do they mean by, by fish on the fringe or reef safe fish? You know, um, that's kind of up in the air. I had a magnificent fox face. And, yes, you know he was great for a long time. Really did good on uh, eating algae, um, and then he took a liking to some of my brain corals and decimated four of them. So I had to get rid of them. So you know, there's a lot of things that go into uh, when you get a fish with that's on the fringe or uh, that's a reef safe with caution. So you've got to pay particular mind to that. But I think if you get a big system and you've got a lot of coral in there, if you're going to introduce a fish that's reef safe with caution you're you are taking a chance you are it's true but you can also design systems around some of these fish so if you want a reef tank and you want angels it's doable yes i am not gonna say it's gonna be easy but you can design a system around the fish so you can kind of get you can kind of find out what corals they're gonna eat and you can design your system around that or a lot of them will go after invertebrates. So you, you can design your system around it not having a big cleanup crew. So a lot of wrasses will eat your snails and crabs and stuff like that. They won't eat your coral. But then you just have to design your system around that. I think it, you're, you're right. I think in my, in my case, um, having a large system, having a cleanup crew is important. It's going to be important. Oh, yeah. 
Um, and you know, so I've got to take that in consideration, which I have already, um, and the type of snails that you get. Uh, I'll probably get more of the trochus snails where they, can, they can't be really flipped upside down like the astrea snails can. They're more, more expensive, but um, they can write themselves up you know, when they fall. Um, Sarah snails, they can get in the cracks and crevices of uh, uh, the rock work really well. Uh, Nasaria snails, um, that's another thing too. So, but you're right, that's, uh, it, it's important. The, uh, so I'm gonna establish my cleanup crew most likely um, before I, I put wrasses in there. And I also think uh, feeding also, if you're feeding your fish well too, um, having good export methods, you're going to keep your, your phosphate nitrate levels down and you're going to keep your fish happy. Well, and, and so that's another good point is when you're figuring out your stocking levels and what fish you're going to buy. I mean, foods are important because certain fish like certain foods. Now, um, the easy answer is, is just to buy fish that will do your standard feeding. But like you were talking about, you want a big school of anthias. So you have to plan on that with your stocking. Your average right. amphibious is going to want to eat four, five, six times a day. Exactly. So, so that's something you have to plan ahead for before you ever walk into the fish store and buy that fish. Exactly. Yeah, that's one thing to take consideration. That even with some morasses, because their stomachs are smaller, they require more feedings um, versus a, a tang. You know, they they can pick at the rock work all day and get their uh, nutrients through the algae and stuff like that. So um, there are different requirements, different feeding levels, uh, feeding requirements for different fish. So that's another thing you have to take into uh, account also. Yeah, I, I'm just loving this idea. And hopefully as we go forward, we'll figure out more of it. Cause I just think a reef tank with angels would be amazing. But the yes. amount of work and trial and error to make that happen successfully would be difficult, but completely doable. I really yeah. like I really like angels, but you know, there's some angels that are they'll be fine, and there's some that take a liking to SPS, and that's what they yeah. Do. So, but, then, I guess but if that's you why it a... would get real weird because there's certain corals they'll eat and certain ones they won't. So your reef would almost be dictated by what either grows fast enough, it's not a problem, right. or by what's not actually getting eaten. Exactly, exactly. So, so it, it, it's just an interesting way to build a reef. You can start with your fish and then build the reef out from that, or you can start with your reef and then add fish to it. You just have to have to figure out which way you want to go. And that's a chance that you take too, also too. So I, I think having a little bit of planning into the system when you're, when you're doing it instead of winging it, I think that really helps a lot. It's not foolproof. Uh, anything can happen, but I think if you... Take a little bit of planning to what you're going to be putting in the tank and how you're going to, uh, uh, you know, aquascape your system out too with the amount of uh, filtration and flow. That That's important also. But uh, take a little bit of, of, of forethought before you do, you know, put your fish in there. And it, it also depends on the size of the, of the tank too and how many fish you want to put in there too. So there's some variables that come into place. Yeah, and, and I'm going to hate to say it when you're talking about how many foot fish to put in your tank if it's starting to feel like maybe it's too many it's too many yeah <laughs> i, I personally true. ran into this problem where i've overstocked tanks with fish and it's just it's not worth it as much as you want to bring that fish home just leave it at the store well when um, you got your tanks and you were you had nine of them in there for quite a long time i did what what happened in your system where was it because of aggression that you lost some or what was it so i mean I had the full gamut, right? I mean, I had aggression. I had some sort of disease go through there. I still don't know exactly what it was. I don't think it was ick or velvet. I'm almost leaning more towards internal parasites or something like that. So, I mean, it all just kind of went wrong. And then also, that little flamingi turned into a big flamingi. So just that one fish, like, doubled my bio load. Right. Because that one fish went from being like this little tiny thing to like the mass of all the rest of my fish combined. How big is that now? Oh, he's like that. But I mean, remember, for every inch they get, they get fatter. And I mean, there's a lot of weight that goes on to these fish. So eventually, eventually you're going to probably have to rehome him, aren't you? 
Eventually, I probably will. Otherwise, it'll be the size of your tank. But and, and so, and I hate to say it, that was one of the things I thought of early on was, I love this fish, and am I going to be able to keep them long term? Probably not. On the bright side, I do have enough outlets that if I need to get rid of a flamingo, it's not a big deal. Right, right. And yeah, by the time I'm ready to get rid of him, he'll be a big show size, and <laughs> somebody's going to want him. Right, I'm sure. With the big yeah. streamers coming off the back. They're absolutely beautiful. I love Lomingis. I just wish they made smaller ones. They are. They are really <laughs> pretty. Yeah, I know. They are really, really nice looking fish. But um, yeah, I think you're right when we talk about uh, different ways to uh, stock a system. So, like I said, nothing's foolproof. But I think if you put a little bit of planning in there, it really goes a long ways. Yeah, planning's huge. Um, because you also have to plan for the max size of that fish. I did plan for that Lamingi. I just um, am now getting to that point where he's getting awfully big for the tank. And that's the thing, too. I think a lot of people probably don't do this. They don't, they don't look at the fish's maximum potential. They look at it, wow, this fish is really colorful. It's really, right. really a beautiful fish. Let me put it in. But they don't realize, hey, I've got a four-foot tank, but this fish can get a foot long exactly so they've got to be careful about that um especially when you're dealing with if you're putting a, a few fish that can grow to their max potential which is 10 12 inches or maybe even bigger than that oh absolutely uh, when you added your flamingo you knew how what its maximum potential could be you knew it was going to be a big fish but i don't think people uh, take that into account when they're dealing with that no it's really easy to see this little tiny fish and not even think twice about how big it's going to get Right. And then you, I have some people ask me, or you hear, well, how many tanks can I get away with in a 75 gallon? Um, probably one or two. Uh, and that's a, right. smaller type, a smaller type of tang. You're dealing with coal yeah. tanks or a smaller type of tang, um, or even a, a zebra zoma. You could get away with having one in there. But when you yeah. s start putting multiples in there, you're going to have, you're going to have problems. Absolutely. Yeah, coal tang and yellow or yellow eye coal <clears throat> tang and a yellow tang perfect in a 75 gallon. One big lamingi, way too big for a 75 <laughs> gallon. <laughs> yeah, way too big. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. So, you know, so like I said, just do your homework before you start putting your fish in there and uh, um, you'll be better better off when you do that. All right, so I don't think we answered any questions with this. There is no stocking limit, and it's all by eye and doing lots of research ahead of time. We do good work, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm it's really how it works. There are no try. hard and fast rules. <laughs> there hey, are me. no hard and fast rules. It's yeah. going to be looking at your tank. It's going to be trial and error. And guess what? It's easier to err on less than more. It is. You'll you won't have problems with less fish. Exactly. It's I think is when you're you're adding too many fish in there, <clears throat> excuse me, at one time, or you're continuously adding in there, then you're gonna run into issues if you don't have the room, if you don't have the proper flow or filtration or the proper export methods, then you're gonna run into issues. And you might get that one fish that uh that is a badass fish that no matter what you put in there is going to go ahead and go after them. So like that's why show hole. <laughs> exactly. I'd love to have a soul hole tank, but if, if I ever do, it's the last fish that's going in. Well, there. and then there is always the chance that that tank would just become a show hole tank. Exactly. And I know how aggressive those are. Um, I think uh, Michael Aaron's, from uh, Aaron's Aquariums had a sole hole tang in there. And, he did uh, use that one, yeah. Beautiful sole hole tang. And uh, he had to wind up rehoming it to a uh, public aquarium because it got so nasty that it was just going after everything. As beautiful as a fish it was, you know, it was, uh, it was, he was having issues with that, with aggression, totally just chasing his other tangs around and other fish around too. So it got to be a problem. So he had to get, he had to rehome it. Well, awesome, Darren. I had a lot of fun with this one. Yeah, me too. Is there anything else you want to say before we go? No, I think we, uh, we covered a lot of different uh, uh, topics related to this as far as uh, stocking. And I, I think uh, if some of those people, that if you're putting a tank together, if you can think of these and implement some of these 
um, things that Scott and I have gone over, I think it's going to have a, a, a better success level um, for you when you're when you're getting your system set up. I think it'll really help. Well, awesome. Well, thank you guys for watching. Um, Darren and I like to just hang out and talk, so we'll keep throwing these out. These videos are pretty much unedited, so we just post what we talk about. So until next time, we'll see you guys later. Thanks.